on chapter 22, we're moving right along. We, we just finished the urinary eliminations. Now we're moving on to bowel elimination, okay? So obviously the bowel elimination is where you are excreting waste from your body through the gastrointestinal or the GI tract, okay? So there are certain factors that will uh, affect bowel elimination, such as privacy. For so, you know, for some reason we, you know, a lot of people do get embarrassed and they don't, I mean, especially if you're having to have someone sit in there with you when you're having a bowel movement or if you have a, if you're incontinent of your bowels, you know, it's very embarrassing. So privacy is always going to be an issue, especially with bowel elimination. Um, bowel habits, okay? Uh, uh, how old you are, obviously, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Diet and fluids, how often you exercise or have activity, and what kind of medications you take or drugs, okay? It always affects your bowel elimination. So basically, when you eat and digest food and it moves from the stomach and it starts going through the intestines, basically it turns into uh, feces that go through the GI tract through what we call peristalsis. Peristalsis is the, the kind of wave-like movements that the smooth muscles do to push the feces down through the intestinal tract. And of course it goes um, into the large intestine to finish up and then to the colon which comes out of the rectum. Now the, the feces is stored in the rectum until it exits the body. So uh, we, we usually call that defecation. That was, is the nice medical term that we use for poop. We call it defecation or a bowel movement BM, which is why I hate it in nursing school because my last name started with M and I had to put my initials on everything as BM. So I kind of got made fun of a little bit. So uh, bowel movement is a process of getting that feces <coughs> out. And again, the frequency and the time of the bowel movements can be different depending on who you are. For some people, it might be normal to have a bowel movement once or twice a day. <coughs> and for other people, it might be every three days. It might be every four days, we hope not, but um, you know, everybody's a little bit different as to how often the, the pattern that they have as far as using the bathroom. So again, stool is what comes out of your body. That is the medical term we use for poop, right? So it should be brown, it should be soft, and it should be formed into a log, and it should be moist and shaped like the rectum, which would be more cylindrical ish right and again it should have a normal odor poop does not normally smell necessarily good but if you have a patient who has C. diff Jalen <coughs> I know you I know you worked with a patient that had C. diff and you guys had to suit up and go in there but it had a different kind of rank nastiness than just normal poop Okay, like C. diff has this smell that you'll never forget once you once you smell it. So again, when you are um, either cleaning up a patient or you're cleaning up a, a bedpan or whatever the case may be, you actually need to assess their poop. Okay, because we want to know what color is it, how much did they have. You will chart whether it's like a small bowel movement, medium, large, things like that. The consistency of it. Okay. You might see that maybe if they have diarrhea, it's watery, watery stools, or we would call that a loose bowel movement, things like that. Or if they had a really hard time, they're really constipated, it might be a hard stool that you can tell looks much, much drier and harder. Then um, if there's any blood or mucus in the stool, we're gonna wanna know that. Fresh blood is a common occurrence because a lot of them because they have had constipation problems and things over time, they have to push so hard to get it out, they form hemorrhoids, okay? And hemorrhoids are basically blood vessels that are um, really enlarged and fragile. So a lot of times they'll have bright red 
blood on their poop because that where it was coming out where the hemorrhoid is it gets all irritated and starts bleeding a little bit so if they actually had internal bleeding higher up in the GI tract I would expect their poop to look like black coffee grounds okay so that's why noting the color is very important there are some medications that turn your poop black like iron if you take iron supplements or if you drink Pepto Bismol that can make your poop look black but you know we worry about black stools more about it in case it was like digested blood basically is what happens if you have a, a GI bleed higher up in the tract so presence of blood or mucus any kind of abnormal odor the shape of it how often they are defecating because we need to keep up and make sure they're not constipated so and you'll see the little old people they obsess over their bowels okay some of them, if they don't have a bowel movement every day, they get tore up, okay? And then again, any kind of complaints of pain or discomfort having a bowel movement. Now, again, when we think about any of the processes that might affect someone having a bowel movement, again, we look at the privacy, the habits, the diet, fluids, activity, medications, aging, any kind of disabilities they might have, and these are all things we think about whenever we um, kind of assess the elimination process in our patients. So some of the common problems again is constipation. And again, I said it's more of a hard, dry stool. And this happens whenever the feces is moving too slow down that GI tract. Because part of what the body does as the feces is moving down is it pulls out water into the body because the feces actually starts out extremely liquidy. And as it moves down the track, the body absorbs a little bit of that water and a little bit of that water through the body until it gets down and then we should have more of a formed soft stool. Now, if the feces is hard or putty-like or they have a lot of abdominal discomfort or crampiness or just yuckiness in general, uh, maybe their belly is swollen because of it. Maybe they even have nausea. If you have been stopped up for long enough, it will because the food can't go down, it makes you nauseated, it makes the food want to come up. Okay, so nausea is a big, a big thing. Cramping, rectal pain, um, poor appetite. If you're, if you're, if you're full of feces and the food really can't go down, then you're gonna lose your appetite. You're not gonna be able to eat, really. Uh, maybe confusion, possibly a fever. Um, and constipation is not a good thing, but what is more dangerous is if, it, it, if they haven't had a bowel movement in a week and a half, two weeks, okay? You might suspect, yeah. I don't have a shower, but every other month. Every other month. Yeah. That is not normal. Every other month. At all. Like four times a day. Like, I don't feel at all. Yeah, that's not normal. I think you're constipated. Like, like we went to the doctor and everything, but they don't do nothing about it. They don't, they don't give you any medication no. like Miralax. They, they just said, try your and go. Like, okay, we'll go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you and I are having a discussion after class. <laughs> and we get you fixed up. <laughs> because we worry about fecal impactions. Okay, if it gets to the point that your patient has a fecal impaction, you're in big trouble. People have actually died from this. Because again, what did we say that the GI tract does? What does it eliminate out of your body? Waste. 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 If waste sits in your body too long, it basically poisons your body, right? <laughs> so if you're not allowed, if, if you can't get rid of it, and it turns into a fecal impaction, it could ultimately cause death, okay? Now, diarrhea is when you go too much, okay? Diarrhea is a frequent passage of liquid stools, okay? Now, always report loose stools because there actually have been cases of people being impacted and the only thing and then all of a sudden they would start having loose stools 
But what was happening was a lot of that fluid from higher up in the GI tract got down and went around that fecal impaction and came out. Okay? So we always report stools and we and, and we don't, you know, any time I see loose stools, if I see they've been very constipated and haven't had a bowel movement a long time before that, then I'm gonna be thinking there's a possible obstruction, there's a possible fecal impaction that only liquid was able to get around and come out. Okay. So that again, that's why it's so important for you guys to chart the frequency and how much people have um, have bowel movements. So if the feces goes too rapidly, the body doesn't have time to absorb the fluids it needs to, so you're going to have more of a liquid-like stool, okay? Now, what we worry about with older people is losing that much liquid. What, what, what could happen to them if you lose too much liquid in your body? Dehydration, okay? Because elderly people are more at risk for dehydration than other people, then we worry about if, if, if diarrhea goes on for too long. So we always try to, you know, we're going to try to really force fluids on them, try to get them to drink stuff to rehydrate themselves. And again, Clostridium difficile, okay, is what we call C. diff for short. That is a microbe that actually causes diarrhea and again has its own category of nastiness, okay. And again, they had to wear um, like gowns and gloves and did you wear a mask too or just the gowns and gloves? I don't, think you need, yeah. I don't think you need a mask for that. It's more of a touch thing. So, uh, yeah, they had to suit up to go and to help change this lady because she had C. diff. It's very, very contagious. Now, if your patient becomes dehydrated, we would expect to see pale flesh or flesh skin, maybe dry skin, a coated tongue. Now, as a nurse, when we check for dehydration, we actually pinch the person's skin and let go and see if it goes right back. If it doesn't, we call that tinting, because it looks like a little tint, right, if it doesn't go right back. And that is one of the ways that we test for dehydration, okay? We would expect a dry nose, a dry mouth, all your mucous membranes. You know, I've, I've been sick enough before I couldn't even cry tears because I had no fluid left in my body. But um, thirstiness, weakness, dizziness, possibly confusion, uh, blood pressure uh, could be super, super low, okay? Because of the loss of fluids. If you don't, because you're, if you are losing fluids from your body, that means your blood actually gets thicker and more compact, okay? So you lose, and that, if, if you lose the volume of blood that makes your, uh, it makes you have less pressure inside of that vessel, right? Because vessels are kind of like a, um, a water hose. The less water in there, there's no pressure coming out, right? But then when you turn the, the faucet hydrant all the way up and put a bunch of pressure in there, then you get a bunch of water pressure to spray stuff down with. So that's the same thing with blood pressure. Less water means lower blood pressure. So when, when people come in with low blood pressure, we start we start an IV and we just push, push. I mean, we try to bag, literally squeeze that bag of fluids and put them in them to give the blood more volume, which increases the volume. You increase the blood pressure. Okay, that was free. Now, always, always, always practice good hygiene, hand hygiene, and wear gloves whenever you deal with any kind of poop. Um, and even importantly, you have to watch these little old people, especially the ones that have dementia, because if they are constipated or having problems, it is not abnormal for them to try and manually get the poop out with their fingers. Okay? They will dig in their booty and try to literally dig and pull out pieces of poop. So that means underneath their fingernails is nasty, and they don't need to be eating food with poop under their fingernails. So you have to practice very good nail hygiene on these, these people, okay? And again, because like we talked about, there could there's the possibility of blood being in their feces, you do need to practice your bloodborne pathogen standards, okay? Fecal incontinence, again, is not being able to control your poop. 
They poop all over themselves. Um, and gas, because gas travels through there too. But it does affect your patients emotionally because it is extremely embarrassing. No one in life ever checks off and says, yeah, I can't wait till I get old and poop all over myself. Okay, it is extremely embarrassing for people and um, it, it affects them a lot emotionally. Sometimes we do try to do things like bowel training, try to get them maybe to sit on the uh, pot after a meal and have them sit there for a while to see if gravity and just that sitting, you know, because after you eat, obviously you start digesting and pushing everything down. So we're hoping that if we set them on the potty, maybe 30 minutes to an hour after they've eaten and leave them on there for a while, maybe just the natural uh, peristalsis will help them need to use the bathroom when you use the bathroom. How many guys have a puppy? Okay, have you ever potty trained? When do you take them outside? You do every hour on a schedule, but also, you know, one of the things that, that like I was taught to do was that about 30 minutes after they eat, go take them outside, right? And that's the same thing with, with people too. Okay. So again, incontinence products, um, we need to make sure that we're changing their briefs constantly providing really good skin care so that they don't, especially if it's diarrhea, again, it's gonna be very acidic and it's really gonna tear them up. So you may even have to use like diaper rash cream and stuff that will help provide some sort of moisture barrier. They have a moisture barrier cream you can use that if you have, if they have a problem with urinating or if they're having diarrhea and stuff that would break down their skin you put this cream on, it's supposed to kind of waterproof the skin a little bit. Flatulence, excessive gas. I have two boys in my house who definitely practice this on a continual basis, okay? So gas and air is passed through the GI tract, comes out the anus, and we call that platus. That is the actual technical medical word, is platus. So if the platus is not, Spell, then your intestines are going to swell up, right? So you might have abdominal cramping, you might have shortness of breath even, um, very swollen abdomen. And a lot of times when people are having gas pains, they will complain of very sharp pains. Like it can hurt, really, really hurt. I've seen people that have excessive um, gas due to like some sort of a milk allergy or some sort of problem with when they ate and they will double up in the floor almost screaming and crying because it hurts so bad these just sharp bad pains so you know we won't take that lightly again uh, bowel training we try to help them develop a regular pattern to try to help their body get used to going at a certain times a lot of people that have really good bowel ha habits like they'll go at the same time every day like every morning, like they're gonna go, or every night, or just, I mean, a lot of people have really good trained bowel habits that will go at the same time every day. So that's what we try to, to um, train a person's body to do if they're having problems with incontinence. And of course, the nurse will tell you and give you instructions, or may even be in the care plan, which would tell you what their bowel habits should be and how to train them. Enemas, enemas is, Something we use, especially if you suspect something like major constipation or even if you suspected a possible, um, I just lost it, I just lost the word. The impaction, that's one thing, an impaction. So basically, we take a bottle that has a tip already on it. It has KY jelly on it already, it's ready to roll. You take the top of it off, you have set them on their side. You squirt that water, slow and steady, up into the rectum, okay? And that will help them then remove the feces out of there. You have to be careful though, and you don't wanna stand behind them after you put that water in. You get around the other side and let, that way if it sprays, it's going that way, okay? You know what I'm saying? You don't want it. 
like I said, if they have problems controlling their bowels anyway, sometimes they can't stop it when it's coming that forceful. Okay. So again, you guys, uh, it does have to be ordered. Enemas do have to be ordered by a doctor. Around here, you guys will not give those. Okay, the nurse will have to do that. And again, we talked about the bagel response and, and how that you could actually kill somebody doing that. It doesn't happen a whole lot, but just because it is a, a, a reality that it could happen, then now we let nurses do it so we can get sued. Now, enema solutions. The ones that we might use would be a tap water enema, just where you get water from the faucet. You might have a saline enema. You know, saline is basically just a mixture of salt water. Then you have a soap suds enema, which is supposed to be even more evil. Uh, soap suds are good and um, slick, right? So we lube that area around the poop so it'll come out easier, right? We have a small volume enema and an oil retention enema. Again, oil being something that's very slick, you lube up the sides of those intestines, sometimes you'll get better results. Most of the ones we use are normally saline, okay? That's usually a first line of defense because some of the other ones can have worse side effects of making them lose too much fluid that, that, that they get uh, dehydrated. But again, if an enema had any kind of medications in it, you would never give it. But again, around here, as far as I know, most of the time only the nurses give them. I'm not saying they would be everywhere, but, but that's what we do in long-term care. Cleansing enemas. Sometimes we, we just need to clean the bowel of feces and coitus. Maybe they have constipation. Maybe it truly is a fecal impaction. But occasionally, you might need them before certain surgeries. What kind of a surgery would require your bowels to be empty? Prostate, maybe. Colonoscopy, for sure. In a colonoscopy, they're basically putting a tube up into the intestines to be able to look for any kind of like polyps or you know any kind of abnormalities in the bowel. And if it's full of fecal matter, they can't see anything. So actually that's one of the worst parts of colonoscopy. I've always heard that the worst part about it is just preparing for it. So uh, used to, they would make you get an enema right before when you were in labor. Because if you had any type of constipation or fecal matter in the intestines, it would make it harder for the baby to come out. So a lot, they used to make you get an enema before you delivered, which sometimes labor is its own natural enema. So when you're in labor, that's one of the symptoms of labor is that, that you just have a bunch, a bunch of bowel movements in the same day. Do you have to get one before you go on straight? You should probably, yeah. Anytime they're putting ace up into your, if they're looking through the, like the intestines, yes. If they were looking at, the, if it was upper, GI and they're only looking at your like uh, esophagus and stomach and stuff that would not be required but yeah we call that a lower the lower GI scope or something like that okay now small volume enemas are something that basically irritate and distend the rectum uh, if someone is constipated or maybe they're just a little bit constipated they don't need the whole full kit and caboodle they just want to basically if you irritate and extend that valve down at the bottom your body is going to react in a way that it tries to expel that out and so we'll just get some of that poop out of there and then hopefully they're well enough that they can continue on from there to have their own bowel movements now oil retention enemas again just relieve constipation or impactions now you will have patients that have ostomies. Ostomies are a surgical opening into um, the intestines, okay? And that opening itself is called a stoma. You know, we have that one mannequin that has those pink, like, little things on there. It looks like a donut, okay? Those are pretend ostomies. That's what an ostomy would look like. They literally make an opening in the skin. They take 
the end of your intestines, pull it out through that hole and pull it over and sew it to the outside skin. So basically what is there is the inside of an intestine. When you see a, an ostomy, that's, that's actually an intestine. You get to see up live and personal. So again, the opening is called a stoma and most of the time they're gonna have like a little Tupperware pouch over that that catches that stool. And if you have one towards the lower end of the intestines, what would you think the characteristic of that stool would be? Thicker. Like more defined. More formed, okay. Kind of more formed, not as much as it would be at the very end of the rectum, but we would expect to see something more formed and mushy, like mushed up bananas. What if it's higher up in the GI tract, what would you expect to see? Liquid. Liquid. If it's high up enough, it's gonna mainly be liquid. It, because we talked about, as it goes down that tract, the body keeps absorbing more liquids, right? So depending on where it is at, you, you know, and depending on the characteristics of the fecal matter that you see, you, you'll be able to know maybe kind of if it's something further down or higher up. So that's something neat to know. So um, again, you do have to watch out too because not only stool goes in that pouch, but gas goes in that pouch and it inflates it up. So there's a lot of times we have to burp the bag and we open it up just enough to get the gas out and then seal it back in. So again, it looks like a Tupperware container, okay? That's how it fits together. So a colostomy has a, a, a basically, they've had part of their colon removed and they have an ostomy there. So it's colostomy, colon, colostomy, okay? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it is a temporary thing, like if they've had some sort of cancer and they have to take out part of the bowel and it rests for a while. And then hopefully it's temporary and then later on they can have another surgery to put those two pieces of, of intestine back together. Okay, however, sometimes it could be permanent depending on uh, the situation of what's going on with the patient. And um, again, depending on where it is would, would change what the consistency of that bowel movement looks like that comes out of there. Now, we worry a lot about uh, and, and work with skincare around these things because if, especially the more liquid it is, if that stuff gets onto their skin, you know, the intestine part is made for that, but your regular skin is not. It eats it up and causes sores and it hurts and it burns because basically they're putting acid on their skin, okay? So good skin care is a must. Then you have an ileostomy. Ileostomy is the same thing. And, um, it means that it's higher up in the intestine. It will be in the ileum, which is a lot higher up in the GI tract. So if it is the in the ileum and higher up in the GI tract, we would expect the stool to be looser and more watery. And, but again, the stools, really, you really don't want them to touch the skin with all that stomach acid and stuff that's, that's been in, that has kind of emptied down into there. So good skin care is required. Now, the pouch, again, we talked about burping it. If it becomes like bulges out and swollen up because it has gas in it, we want to get the gas out of there. You also want to wipe it with toilet tissue before you close it. Uh, as far as the pouch itself, it says every three to seven days or if it leaks, you know, we try to go with a week if we can, but we try to change it, you know, if it starts leaking or something, if there's a problem in between times, we would change it even more often. But um, because what you do is you basically stick part of it onto their skin, with an, it has an adhesive on the back. If you constantly are taking on and off adhesives on their skin, it's gonna break their skin down. So we try to leave it as long as possible, okay? It's like putting a Band-Aid in one spot and tearing it off every day, okay? You're tearing off pieces of skin every time you do that. So we really try to go that seven days if possible to keep, to prevent more skin breakdown. Now, Showers and baths, we try to wait at least an hour or two after we've already put the new patch on so that 
it will seal really good. And again, not that you would do this, and I don't know who would, but evidently someone has, or we don't, wouldn't have this instruction on there. Don't flush those big pouches, okay? Now, uh, quality of life, again, you always want to respect their rights. You want to respect their privacy. Uh, help them as needed, as directed by the care plan. Always help your patients when they need it. And again, privacy is a big thing. And again, they do have the right to personal choice um, if that's available, okay?